And Questine here with more Age of Empires 4. The French campaign, Hundred Years War. The combat of the 30, 13, 51 chivalry. I'm gonna restart this mission already. It's pretty fast, it's pretty quick, and then you get Paris in 1360. Let's do it. In 1350, what we know as the idyllic French countryside was a living hell. For more than 15 years, the people had suffered at the hands of English invaders. Little did they know that this war would last for another hundred years. But through this crucible of fighting, famine and plague, there would emerge the modern nation of France. England's King Edward III looked jealously across the English Channel. Wanting France for his own, he had added the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, to his own royal standard. This was an all out declaration of war. And in 1337, he invaded. But France already had a king, Philippe VI. As the English burned their way across the land, Philippe's army and his legendary knights marched to meet them and came face to face with the English longbow. A simple weapon, but the most devastating the knights had ever faced. The heroes of France fell to storms of English arrows. The war engulfed the French countryside. By 1351, the conflict was focused on Brittany. One fight stands out as a spectacular display of chivalry and a symbol of the wider conflict between the two enemy nations. The combat of the Thirty is still commemorated here in Brittany. It was a dispute between two local families Supported by the opposing sides in the war, the French and English commanders decided to settle it through a trial of knightly combat. Each side would choose 30 champions to fight on neutral ground. France prepared to defend itself against England's finest. All right, combat of the 30, 1351. The French captain Jean would enlist 30 great fighters to defend France's claim to Brittany. On the opposing side, England's fiercest champions represented their king. The two sides would clash in an arena of chivalric combat. Okay, let's get to it. Brittany. Intent on ending the suffering of the French peasantry, Sir Jean de Beaumanoir sent a challenge to the English commander. 30 champions on each side would compete in a tournament for final claim to Brittany. With the battleground of the halfway oak agreed upon, Sir Jean set out to gather support from local knights. In an army. <laughs> or 30 fighters. Let's go. As a knight himself, Sir Jean followed the strict rules of chivalry and was expected to protect the local peasantry and ensure peace. Okay, we get a couple of spearmen. Sir Olivier. All right, he has Spearman and Regeneration. Most medieval tournaments were friendly in nature, held for sport and glory, but the combat of the Thirty 
was arranged between opponents mired in war. English raids had torn through the countryside of Brittany and brought great hardship to the people. So Jean spotted an English raiding party attacking a nearby farmstead. Sir Guy de Rochefort. Regeneration is actually pretty strong. All right, we got uh, another one. The French knights defeated the English raiders, and Sir Guy de Rochefort joined Sir Jean's party. All right, Looking to secure bridge. his honor, a young knight held his ground on a bridge in Sir Jean's path. That's so easy. I mean, he has half my HP, so. Honorably conceding defeat in the duel, Sir Yves Charel joined the cause. All right, we have one final knight that we can recruit. I'm just gonna save here because the next part can actually. Um, you might actually fail. In the all right. Sir Jean's okay. search next brought him to Sir Geoffroy Dubois, whose squires were contending with a detachment of English longbowmen. The knights would use the great speed of their war horses to charge the archers and overwhelm them. The English longbowmen fell, but the French knights knew the enemy would attempt to retake the hilltop fortification and steeled themselves for further attacks. Easy enough. All right, so we need to hold the fort for more seconds. With Sir Geoffroy by his side, Sir Jean had secured the outpost. Let's read the movement speed. So we've done the bonus objective. Look at them run.
Obéir, c'est cette vertu. Aveillez votre Mets votre donc En la bouée Oui, Soutli, commande de Jorid, un... Blatch, avec ton snos en la bouée All right, so halfway oak. So Jean entered the staging area for the tournament, where he prepared to choose which knights would join him in battle. So we're dealing with knights, horsemen, and men-at-arms. And we have to choose what we go for. I can get four royal knights and horsemen. Each by his squires, young nobles in training to become knights themselves. I'm gonna go with Guy, Guy, Joffrey, and now we'll be So Jean had selected his champions. As the sun rose, the two sides entered the arena, ready for the first round of combat. All right. Claiming an easy victory in the first round, the French champions left the arena to recover their strength. You will heal here. All right, we can get armor, and then we go back in and we finish the mission. Really, we only lost five guys. They lost. All Refreshed and reinvigorated, the French knights returned to the arena for another round of combat. I was rather hoping those two men at the combat of the thirty their... was about to decide which nation would control the Duchy of Brittany. Well. Let's fight. Triumphant, Saint Jean de Beaumanoir and his loyal knights claimed victory. The combat of the Thirty had decided control of Brittany in favor of the French. Little did the two sides know, this was just the beginning of a bitter war that would outlive them all. All right, a tournament of war. The combat of the Thirty was a bloody counterpart to the pageantry knightly just, but also returned to form. By 1350, just were focused on showmanship or over actual combat. Grand Pavillon's bed knights uh, hid knights ahead of dramatic reveals. An opening day parade displayed combatants in heraldic glory. Knights wielded blunted arms and competed for a rich purse. But tournaments started as training for war. In the earlier centuries, jousts were only part of the tourney. Brutal melees with keen-edged weapons were just as important. Injury and even death were common. The most dangerous of these tourneys opposed national groups of knights, especially French and English, which often developed into pitch, pitch battle. This was the tradition revived by, uh, for the combat of the Thirty. Okay. In the Hundred Years' War, the English used a terror tactic, a raid through enemy territory intended to intimidate and provoke the French into battle. 
It was called Chevache. The principal weapon for Chevache was fire. And one of the ways it was delivered was with incendiary arrows. Challenge with incendiary arrows? Keeping them alight. One type of incendiary arrow was fueled with gunpowder. You've got charcoal, got sulfur, and we've got saltpeter. Saltpeter is the main ingredient. The more oxygen you put into it, the hotter it burns. Of course, when it's on an arrow, when it's being shot, you've got a turbocharged airstream. The chemicals are bound together with brandy, left to dry and poured into a linen bag. The extra long arrowhead is inserted into the bag and then tied off to secure it. It is then sealed by dipping it into boiling tree resin. This resin, which itself is highly flammable, provides a waterproof casing. It also shields the burning gunpowder so the wind doesn't put it out in flight. Now that looks deadly and I really want to shoot it. The art to shooting an incendiary arrow is timing. Too early and it will go out. Too late, it will spit at you like a dragon. That was just evil. <laughs> that was great. The word chevauche means horse raid and it was mobile light horsemen who spearheaded the attacks. They took gold and silver from the churches, valuables from wealthy citizens, and as much food and drink as they could find from anyone. A chevauche was scorched earth warfare to create discontent amongst the enemy's subjects, perhaps even to get them to turn against their king. An army on campaign needed a decisive battle. And a chevauche was intended to taunt the enemy to come out and fight. I see. Well, let's go and see the next one. After victory at the combat of the 30, the French faced devastating raids from England's Black Prince. But France's King Jean II was closing in. Jean finally caught the English near the city of Poitiers in September 1356. The French army outnumbered the English by thousands. King Jean himself joined the fight, but what seemed a certain victory for France soon turned into a nightmare. The English longbow devastated the mighty French army. An endless hail of arrows gutted the main French force. Then the English captured King Jean. The fight was over. The Battle of Poitiers was another catastrophic defeat for the French. The English had destroyed most of France's nobility in a single day. Now they turned their attention towards taking the French capital, Paris. The invaders marched unopposed towards Paris. The remains of some of the medieval walls of Paris still stand today. As the English army approached, the terrified locals sought shelter behind these defences. Could France's capital withstand the full might of the Black Prince's army? Well, they don't call him the Black Prince for nothing. 1360. Poitiers. Cressy. The English were coming for Paris. As 
As Parisians took shelter behind the capital's walls, uh, the French army prepared to defend the city. Only their determination of a few feet of stone stood between victory and defeat. Okay, so we need to protect our villagers. Um, and we're gonna have to ab abandon the countryside because the English are coming and they outnumber us. And there is no aid to be had because, well, the French army is dead. It's worth knowing, though, for all the talk of Cressy, Pathier, Agincourt, overall, the French won the war. I mean, consider this, the Am Angevin Empire, Richard the Lionheart, all that kind of stuff. That controlled over half of France. And they lost it. All of it. Anyway. Paris, 1360. The English Black Prince had raided the French countryside without mercy. And now, his army had come for the capital. With the English on their doorstep, it fell to the French army and the people of Paris to defend the walls of their proud city. We have horsemen, crossbowmen, men-at-arms, and a couple of villagers, by the looks of it. Mills inside the walls of Paris. Believe me, you will need them. Hoping to avoid open battle, the French began fortifying the city, manning the walls and calling every available soldier to his post. All right. We need to get the peasantry inside. As the, the French village. hastened their preparations, several detachments of English soldiers were spotted closing in on the city. Right, they're gonna burn the countryside, so I need to withdraw every single person inside. We do have resources inside the city, that's not gonna be a problem. We do also have these outposts. Oh yeah, it's tout le monde. Si, All right. The English showed no mercy, burning their way to Paris via three routes, each of which was home to villages and farms that supplied the capital. I've got 12 out of 16, 12 out of 16, 14 now. Ah, oh, there we go. Did I miss one? Yep. There we go, the last one. All right, we fallen back inside the city. We didn't lose a single villager. Now the battle is going to start. We're gonna need multiple town centers. Okay, so while the English are burning everything to the ground in the countryside, we need to prepare. The walls. Well, they're barely held by anyone. We need 
wood. We need uh We need another town center, really. Alright, they're burning the countryside. They keep burning that countryside. Do we have a market somewhere? As the French continued to rally their army, the English took the last of the surrounding villages and had almost encircled Paris. We need the archers and we need crossbows. With the countryside in flames and the English at the city gates, the French army steeled themselves for battle. Now came the capital's true test, with the mighty walls of Paris hold against a fearsome English siege. <laughs> That's a good question, would they? The Parisian guard raised the alarm as the English began their first assault on the city walls. Okay. That's a lot. Let's clear this up. That is an enormous amount of units. Alright, do I have... Yes, I do. They're pretty strong. Gold. And there's one. Don't steal a race. Compagnon, rest the barrage. Base, alors, ça va. And there's one. army fought valiantly, repelling the first English attack. Problem is... No, there's gonna be more. 
Alright, they're gonna deal with that. That's not gonna be a problem. Alright, they're gonna go for this brick or gold file now. Yep, I knew that was coming. Although the walls of Paris have been breached, the French could still hold the city, so long as its mighty landmarks did not fall. That's a bold statement. Oh shit. Help. Access best boss. Swag in continent. All right, boys and girls, you fall back. All right, we're gonna need to... Get more archers. The French defense of their capital held firm, wearing down the English invaders one by one. We need a monastery. Alright, where is the next attack wave? I don't see it. They do have a lot of veteran spearmen over there though. This is why you need a gate. Oh, yes, see. 
We need to... Okay, we are starting to run out of resources, actually. Sources. Let's get another peep. Walls still stand on some parts, at least. But now... Now we're about to be crushed by a massive assault on several sides at once. The enemy grew ever more desperate as their ranks thinned and their hopes of victory faded. Alright, we are going to need to... Got some horsemen over there. 
faut-il donc besoin de Bayonne, dictez-moi mon Versailles. Bayez-vous, bon, il traite sans nul arrest. Que faut-il donc besoin Ostia le reste, homme faut traite, je vais aller bastir. Well, we're about halfway done. Unfortunately, halfway is not fully. and worse. Well, fall back to the castles. We're out of resources and out of time. Oh, there's some some stuff left. I'm gonna mine that. For no other reason, really. There's gotta be some better way of this. 
<laughs> I'm getting my ass handed to me. That was rough. And all those trebuchets just splattering me into the ground. So I'm gonna need more stables. I'm gonna need to get my guys on stone so I can sell it, get a bunch more resources. I think I should get Springles, actually. Okay, it's sunny day, but all right. There genuinely has to be some better way. All right. There's your better way. L'or se bâtit, je sais tuer. Que faut-il donc suis son wesh Compagnon, chasse mes boss au bon espace. Que faut-il donc de dit taille sans ni la reste Je valide vitesse moi une baisse. Now there are a few issues with this. Springles can't fire. Or shoot. Behind walls, I think. The enemy grew ever more desperate as their ranks thinned and their hopes of victory faded. Alright, we're gonna pull all these archers to the north. Alright, bonus damage against Siege. Oh, 
Stop the Rams there. these guys up on that wall what remains of it Let's say the least. Your party don't besoigne. Oh, yeah, it's to the man. Lord's party. Avertan, the man. Giovanni Bastille. Yeah, Oh, yeah, that's it's way exploited. Yes, yes. All right. That was the last of it. Okay. Survived. Defeated and demoralized by the strength of the French defense, the Black Prince's army abandoned their siege of the capital. Paris celebrated victory, but this was not the last test the French would face in their struggle to win the war. That's a victory, all the same. Edward, the Black Prince, inspiring admiration and terror like Edward, the Black Prince of England, was the prominent warrior of his lifetime. 
At the Battle of Poitiers, Edward faced a far superior French force, but used keen tactics to turn the tide. He lured enemy knights into unsupported charges, then deployed his longbowmen and knights against weakened flanks. By the day's end, he had destroyed the enemy force and captured the French king. Although Edward's uh, genteel treatment of his prisoner won him a reputation for chivalry, to the common people of France, he was a monster. The prince was infamous for the brutality of his raids across the countryside, burning and pillaging hundreds of town without, uh, towns without mercy. For good or ill, the black prince was the model for English knighthood in the Hundred Years' War. All right. The battlefields of the Hundred Years' War were full of danger. To defend against these weapons, a new type of armor was developed. Plate armor. Plate armor clad the knight in an articulating exoskeleton of hardened steel. A hard outer shell that still flexes and moves with the body. It provided impressive protection and was an extraordinary technological achievement. Now, one of the ways that armor gets its strength is through shape. Both of these pieces are made out of the exact same thickness as steel, but I can show you there was one stronger than the other. Here's the one with no shape. You see, it buckles immediately. If I swap it for one that's been forged to have strength and shape, you can see it's much stronger. It's going nowhere. It wasn't just the shape that gave it strength. It was also how the metal was treated by the armorer. Now, the benefits of using heat is it obviously makes the piece more plastic, more ductile, lets me shape it. But the fuel also adds layers of carbon into the outer surface. This helps me increase the hardness and strength of the material. The art of the armorer was being able to judge the temperature of the metal by eye, managing the heat to create resilience in the metal. The combination of heat-treated metal and rigid shapes meant that armor didn't need to be so thick and heavy, making it much easier to fight in. But good quality plate armor did have its downside. It was very expensive. Now, not everyone could afford full steel plate armor. For the common man, there is a brigandine. Now, these are made up of overlapping steel plates that are then riveted through a textile outer. This gives you a much bigger range of movement, but is limited and is not as strong as a full steel breastplate. That said, it is much cheaper and much easier to maintain. At its best, the armored knight was invincible. But armor didn't just provide defense. It was also a weapon and an expression of a knight's power and prestige. Armor transformed its wearer into a work of art. All right, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, plate armor was very expensive and very difficult to get, get through those defenses. I'm concerned of the level of craftsmanship. Um, yeah, anyway, Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. That was the Siege of Paris, <laughs> defending on three ways. Uh, pretty nasty, pretty nasty. I'm sure there m could be a way to funnel them in something, but this is not like H2. In H2, believe it or not, in H2, you can funnel enemies into, choke, into a single choke point. And that makes it significantly easier than having to deal with free, as it is here. Anyway, stay tuned for more.